Welcome to Growing a B2B SaaS. On this show, you'll get actionable and usable advice. You'll hear about all aspects of growing a business to a business software company. Customer success, sales, funding, bootstrapping, exits, scaling, everything you need to know about growing a startup and you'll get it from someone who's going through the same journey. Now your host, Joran Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Grow Your B2B SaaS podcast. My name is Joran Hoffman. I'm the founder of Reddit and the host of this podcast. In our season one, we had 20 guests on the show and we all asked them the same question, which was, what kind of advice would you give a startup founder growing to 10K MRR? In this episode, you're going to hear all of their replies cropped into one episode, which is, in my opinion, invaluable advice. Before you hear the guest speak, I will let you know who it is and which episode. This way you can listen to the show later and hear their full advice. So without further ado, let's go. In episode one, we spoke with Peter Loving regarding UI and UX design basically talking about the importance and best practices. Let's hear what he has to say. In terms of building a good customer experience. So think about how you would like your users to think and feel when they use your product. What emotions do you want them to come away with? What impression? If you were asking them to describe their experience using a product, how would you like them to describe it? So if you get clear in that, then, then you can take that insight and put it in towards your, towards your design. And that informs how, you, how you'll approach it. Oh, I want my users to feel empowered. I want them to feel like we've saved time, that the tasks that they were doing before that were quite painful, we've made it a lot easier for them. So they've, they have a sense of relief. Now, this is just one example because there's a million different characteristics and feelings or thoughts they could come away with. But say if you take those, thing, that those three things like time saving, relief and empowerment, then that gives you an idea of how you're going to approach the feature set, the kind of language you're going to use in your in your product because obviously there's a lot of copy there's a lot of ux messaging in there so you might use empowering language or time saving kind of language in in your in your workflows so that really helps uh, and, and one analogy i like to give for onboarding is to treat it like imagine the experience of going to a five star hotel when you arrive in a hotel there's a huge amount of work that they've put into giving an impression and an experience to people who visit the, the space so everything from the way the interior is designed the way they welcome you when you get to reception in the lobby people come to help you they take your bags they ask you for what you need they tell you about the facilities events things they might have there like restaurants gyms or spas they in, they welcome you and introduce you to everything so everything around that is designed to give the the visitor or the customer a very strong experience and I sometimes liken that to onboarding in a product. When somebody comes and tries out your product for the first time, are you giving them an experience that kind of leaves them with that? Wow, they've got, they're really looking after everything I need. They, they're really caring for all of our problems. They understand us. They, uh, you know, can they relate to, to that? Do they see that you understand them and that you're solving their issues? So that's, that's a nice way to think about it. Think about it from the thoughts and feelings and emotions uh, point of view. And then you can work back to, towards, it, you know, instilling your product with, with the kind of interactions that promote those thoughts, emotions, and feelings. In episode two, we spoke with Mike Dry regarding customer success, the importance and best practices. Let's hear what Mike has to say. I would say it's never too early to start. And I think the steps that you want to take early on relate to some things that I said earlier on as well, that they, they come down to starting to think ahead. If somebody has to subsequently take these responsibilities off of you and in, in your small team and they need to deal with the customers, what are they going to need? What would benefit them or make their job easier? Certain things we've talked about being, for example, tracking metrics, tracking product usage, keeping a really good, accurate check of the conversations you've had with those customers. What have they been about? How effective have you been in solving their problems? Just starting to collect that information, ideally in a CRM system of some sort so that somebody can subsequently come in, take a look at this and take it further with you afterwards. In addition to that, I think you can assist you can basically extend that same thinking to reporting. You can extend it to whether you're going to have a support function in the future. Just quite simply thinking, if all goes well, where are we going to be in six or 12 months? 
And what is the person that I'm about to hire going to need? Especially if it's something you're not otherwise going to do because you just don't have the time available, you should do it. For instance, it might be setting up reporting. Do you need to get a contractor in for two weeks now to hook things up so that you have really good reports around all the ways that your product is being used? If you do that, not only will you be in a better position to guide the overall business, whoever comes in, help you afterwards, they won't have to ask you as many questions. They'll be a lot clearer on what success looks like. It'll be a lot easier for them to take weight off of you as opposed to put it back on. In episode three, we spoke with Evan Weber regarding affiliate marketing and how to leverage it for your B2B SaaS. Let's hear Evan. I would immediately go and find some other dashboards to partner with and get on the phone with them and, and try to figure it out, make it happen. Say, listen, we we have 10,000 users using our tool, a free trial basis, and they're, we're going to let them all know about your tool. And can you, you do the same for us? We'll pay each other as an affiliate. That's the first type they should go after. Then they should start looking for influencers in the niche, influencers in the industry, or people that are just like, look like good connections in the industry. Anyone can really be an affiliate if they have a decent amount of connections. As long as their connections are in the industry, you want to you wanna expose it to. And then the third type I would go after are websites and blogs that have content, articles about your type of tool, your type of software, your type of solution. Run Google searches. Best tools for sales. Best tools for retargeting. Best whatever the niche is, whatever the software type is. Go look at all the sites ranking organically in Google and see who comes up in the paid paid traffic. Because you can advertise in the paid, but that's that's a pay-per-click campaign. The organic results, those are usually articles about the best tools. Reach out to all those public, those are, they call them publishers. Reach out to all those web publishers and see if you can get them to be an affiliate. Ask them to be your affiliate and say, you have a perfect article. We can insert our link right here. We'll even give you a, a hundred dollars just for doing it. We'll just give you a hundred dollars if you do it. And then we'll pay you 10% residual. Throw money at them. Throw. That's what I mean by having, you have to have a budget to grow your affiliate program. And you have to throw around money to bri basically bribe these publishers and these affiliates to do something for you. It's not, it's nothing wrong with it. You're just, you're just paying them to act. Say, listen, if you make a, you find a good LinkedIn person, Hey, listen, if you do a post, I'll pay you a hundred dollars and I'll pay you 10% on all the uh, affiliate referrals. They'll be like, okay, no, now it depends who it is. They might want a thousand. Right. Or they might want 200, you know, so or they may be like, no, I don't do that. But if you if you you're offering money, they're probably going to say yes, because and you're giving them all the content. You don't, they don't even have to do any work and we're going to pay you. Do you think they're going to say yes? Absolutely. But the no one approaches it like that, though. But that's a really great way to approach it with the right people. You don't just throw one hundred dollars at everybody. You, you, you offer it to the, to the right people that look like they actually have the right connections that, that need to know about your software. Go find five of those a month, five of those a month to do that with. The ones that work, you keep doing it. Say, post again, we'll pay you another hundred. You know, you can actually see if it results in, in sales because you're tracking it as an affiliate. It's almost like media buying, but that's like having a budget for your affiliates and influencers. That's like melding affiliate with influencer, right? So you're paying them a little bit of money and you're giving a commission. That's called a hybrid deal. So that's how you can work with people so they won't tell you to go take a hike. You're offering them money. They're not going to say no. And they're going to make a commission on the back end, which hopefully they make money on that as well. And then by that time, if they're actually making money, they might actually say, shit, I can make some money with this. I'm going to post once a week. I'm going to create more blog posts. I'm going to do this, that, and that. If it becomes something they're actually making money with, they're going to repetitively do it. And that's how I work too in the referral space. The companies that I refer business to that I actually make money with, I refer them more business. Because I'm making, I'm seeing money, right? Your mind just automatically goes to the, so if you have an affiliate program, you could just say, okay, this month we're going to take a thousand dollars and we're going to offer it or offer a hundred dollars to 10 influencers and see what happens. What a great way to kick off your affiliate program. Now it has to convert, right? Otherwise you're spending the money for nothing. You know what I mean? All you have to have is a decent, you know, click to registration rate. And then the back end conversion hopefully is, you know, five to 10%, right? And if those numbers hold true, 
it's a slam dunk winner. If they even come close to those percentages, it's a winner. It's a massive winner. So yeah, that's how you, that's how you do it. That's how you do it in the, you know, with affiliates and influencers with SaaS. In episode four, we spoke with Kevin Tai regarding sales processes and the importance and best practices of having one. Let's hear from Gavin. My advice would be is don't scale too quickly. You've got to be able to get the voice of the customer. You need to talk to as many customers as you can or un- like have an hypothesis of the value that you'll provide. I think of a sale as a journey, like a beginning, a recommended journey and then an end. So we need to get them to a starting point where we can demonstrate the most amount of value. Most problems in all software in today's not B2B SaaS, but our the, where we're trying to replace comes from duplicated processes, disparate sources of truth, you know, manual effort, lack of visibility, all this kind of stuff. So aligning your solution is the opposite of that, but highlighting all the problems of the causes in their business, but practicing your message and doing that effort and trying to talk to as many customers as you can and aligning it to those problems, but then you'll find the right people. There'll be people looking for a solution and they're the early, the innovators. As soon as you present your problem the right way, they'll buy you, you won't sell to them. And then you will, um, but you've got to find them. They're hard to find. They're really rare. Yeah. And in this case, when you say you, you mean the actual founders. So to come back to what we said before, don't hire a salesperson before you actually sold yourself. If you can build a strong relationship with a company and they buy into your journey and they really love your mission, they, they respect you as a founder, that gives you a lot of leeway for lack of, lack of features or an MVP. So you want to be able to bring them on the journey with you and, and get behind you and root for you and want you to succeed. That's not going to happen with a salesperson. It's rare that it happens with a salesperson. That only happens with a founder. So um, initially, and then you can transfer that to the um, to others, but they're going to buy the person really in the beginning. So don't be afraid of that. In episode five, we spoke with Antti Sukanen regarding product-led growth and how to get started. Let's go to Antti. I would say that uh, as as we are going in that stage, kind of um, figuring out our way to 30,000 MRR this year, we are putting a lot of focus on, on testing and A-B testing and uh, getting the client feedback. So so that's, that is kind of, a, we are uh, kind of pulling out the process that we can get viral loop of from that feedback, from the testing to actually product implementation and, and trying before, before launching. So we want to make the cycle so that we can improve all the time, little by little. So, so I, I think that is something that I think that I have worked for us and, and is, is, is going to work for us in, in the long run. So we heavily involve our, our clients and kind of, a, I would say, community to the development all the time, getting the feedback. And after going for bigger, I would say that uh, kind of a, a scalability, take more of the customer success role as an maybe some more sales that motion involved. So, so there are going to be heavy users that really love your product. There's really a heavy opportunity that you can cross sell can sell more of those accounts, can help them really succeed with your product, can really get on their opinion and what they would like to see in the future. They are the ones, ones that are going to advocate your product to other users or on the word of mouth. So taking that viral loop also in account in the latter. Yeah, and I think what you said at the beginning, right, getting a lot of customer feedback, I think maybe the misconception of PLG is that you can just, once you have the basics, you can just mm. sit back, relax, and your product will grow. <laughs> I, th- I think that's not going to be true because as you already mentioned, like you like to talk a lot to mm. clients. So it will yeah. take you a lot of time. You will do a lot of testing. You will need to change things around. Maybe one question here still, like how do you get that client feedback? Because you're kind of creating a product where you don't want people to talk to you, but then mm. you do talk a lot to your clients. Like how do you get their feedback? So there's two ways I, I, I'll do it. So so now that the, somebody is signing in on showing the interest of our product, I, I'll try to myself to get them on the call so so this is for the first time i i wouldn't recommend it in the long run i would say but at this stage that that is really effective just give a 15 20 minute call okay you did it did you like it how did you feel it okay you dropped out what was the reason would you consider it if, if you, you would get a help to try to try it again and then get the feedback and another way is is building up the community kind of uh, let's say in the slack or or something like that kind of pilot users the first early 
adapters, get the group of people there. If you have an opinion of 10 people, that's a, that's a lot in any kind of uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, aspect. So, but if you get an opinion of 100, it's already a uh, usable knowledge. I think the challenge here is everybody wants a community, right? And I, I yeah. feel like you already or, uh, already create one. Like, how do you make sure that people really engage in a community like that? Because they're probably in uh, a dozen. How mm -hmm. do you make sure that they really want to collaborate? Well, I would say that when they are paying for the product they wanna. So, so we are giving some kind of a, maybe a little discount of the product or or kind of a good deal on the product. But the, but the point is that they are paying for it, and when they are paying for it, they are more engaged. So if you are getting something for free, it's who doesn't like free stuff, uh, as we yeah. know. But uh, but 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 giving your opinion on that, if you haven't really tried or implemented in that in your organization, is is not it's gonna be hard. Yeah, and I think there has to be uh, a commitment from both sides. So if somebody is mm. not paying, they're not as committed as they're getting something for free. So I think just giving out your product for free isn't a good idea. Then doing yeah. what you guys doing, give some kind of discount, big discount, mm. but at least have them commit to something on their end as yes. well. Yes, and, and also they are kind of first to get to try these features. They are first kind of that has an opinion on that, that what's going to be the the futures or all the pro future products. So it's, uh, I think in all along this win-win from them. And if they, let's say, engage for one year or two year deal, they're going to keep the price quite low for that period of time, get the new features, get the feedback and all of that. So it's, we see it as a win-win. In episode six, we spoke with Andrew Davis, CMO of Paddle, on how to go to market with your B2B SaaS. Let's hear what Andrew has to say. I mean, fundamentally at that stage, it's about getting those first handful of happy customers, five customers, 10 customers, however many it means for you to build that initial base of revenue, revenue so you can start stabilizing the business and investing in the future. So you need to do things that don't scale at that stage. You might be traveling around the country, meeting people. You might be going and knocking on doors. You might be, uh, I can remember at um, one of the businesses I started was a web design agency at university. And we would be walking across the fields from our university to knock on the door of schools and accounting firms and architecture firms to try and get those first happy customers. So at the very, very beginning, it's a case of doing whatever it takes, however unscalable it is, in order to get those first handful of happy customers that then tell you about where your product should be going and also can refer you. In episode seven, we spoke with Patrick Campbell, the CEO of ProfitWell, and how he bootstrapped his company to a $200 million acquisition. Let's hear the advice of Patrick. I think that one's just like cuddle with the chaos, honestly. Like that's just, your first 10K, you're kind of like, it's a little bit of a knife fight. You're just like, all right, I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna like try this. I'm gonna try that. I think if you have the runway, try to focus on some measure of engagement or activation with your user before you focus on the money. Like make 10 people ecstatic and using your product either every day if it's a if it's kind of a workflow product or you know not at all but still seeing the value if you're kind of a, a, a more of a set it and forget it type product. That's more important I would argue than the 10K, but sometimes you need the 10K to survive depending on you know where your business is and if you're doing this as a side project or a full-time thing. I think then it's it gets infinitely easier because then you have those 10 people and maybe you expand it to 50 depending on what the product is. And then, you know, hey, we're going to charge for this now or we're going to charge for this version of it. And, you know, you kind of, you start from a really strong foundation. I think sometimes tactically, a lot of people will do some lifetime deals and people are only buying because of lifetime deals or they're like, let's go through this distribution channel and they get customers, but then they all churn. And it's like, You've just injected a bunch of noise into your judgment in order to make decisions. And it felt good. And sometimes you have to make some of those short-term decisions to get you know, funding and stuff like that. But I don't know, if you have the ability to be somewhat patient, like patient over the midterm, but like not patient at all over the short term, I think that's, that's the right mindset to have. In episode eight, we spoke with Alexander Thuma, CEO of SaaStock, on how to grow a network to kickstart your growth. Let's hear what Alex has to say. So I, I think you mentioned about, I'm doing this podcast, but I wonder if it's too soon, your journey. 
And I, what I said was that it's never too soon. And this is what I did, you know, building an audience first. And this is what I mentioned Anthony Kennedy is doing with Audience Plus, what Drift did. It's never too early to do content marketing and building an audience, building a community, having then customers or potential customers that you can speak to that's going to help shape your product, right? Then I think on that, the early stage, again, kind of like where where you are, or, you know, founders kind of like getting to 10K MRR, speak to your customers, speak to your customers. So many companies don't do it. So many SaaS companies don't do it. What are the main reasons that SaaS companies die? Yeah, they run out of cash, main reason, but it's because they're not speaking to their customers and then they end up building something that customers don't want or doing the wrong positioning because they're not hearing or listening to the customers, marketing in the wrong channels, selling at the wrong price points. And I took like with the SaaS.Founder membership, speaking to the customers has been trans transformational. Speaking to the customers has led me to increase the pricing three times in a year. Keep saying like, it's too cheap. I can't believe you sold it at this price. It's like, oh, you know, we're trying to just get it going. You need to raise the prices. Okay. I raise the prices and then I raise the prices and say, you told me to raise the prices. I've raised the prices. Thank you very much. And then that gives us more MRR, right? So I think that's probably like the the, the key thing in, in within that stage, speaking to customers. I mean, in also in the, the, the journey of building a SaaS company, like never stop speaking to customers, right? I think like sometimes people don't do it enough. And then like, as you start to build the company in your 10K MRR and beyond, I think they're largely like the people, right? Getting, building the right team. You build the right team, you're, you're kind of halfway there. In episode nine, we spoke with John Uzia, creating a content strategy that drives signups. Let's hear what John has to say. The thing is like, I already gave the, the example of never skip customer research, but then the other thing is what most early stage companies do is like, I don't know if they hear it from somewhere. Maybe their buddies are talking about how to do content marketing in, in cocktail party or something like that. But it's like, everyone's acting like a huge company. They start to, oh, let's do some PR. Oh, let's do some um, awareness. Oh, let's do some brand building. Okay. Well, you'll do all that stuff. Good. But you only have five customers. Just like, just calm down and and start building your funnel from bottom to top, right? So when I say bottom to top, what most companies do is I say like they start with top of the funnel. Most people think that funnel, that they look at the marketing as a funnel, which is, I don't believe that it's just like a vertical funnel like that. They see, okay, well, if I take someone from top of the funnel, I'll move them to middle of the funnel and then I'll move them to bottom of the funnel. It's easy. Like they'll, they'll just click on articles and then they'll become a customer. No, and it doesn't work, especially if you're in B2B SaaS, so it could take months, right? And you don't have months, as an early stage startup. So what you wanna do is reverse the funnel, right? So you start from the bottom of the funnel. You start writing content about people who are looking for solution like yours, best XYZ tools. Some people call this middle of the funnel, some people call this bottom of the funnel, but I'm just gonna give examples of it. So you start from you know content that, you start from targeting people who are looking for a solution like yours. Best tool, best uh, competitor alternatives, you know, best tool for XYZ use case or persona. And then you move your way up. Then you start writing about the jobs to be done of your audience. So what is it that they want to achieve? How to reduce churn? Okay, let's write how to reduce churn and show people how to do that. Then at the end, you come to the top of the funnel. Then you can do your brand building, your PR activities, because now you're exhausted the bottom of the funnel and you're generating signups and you made some revenue, right? Then you can expand into other topics and build different funnels. That's my number one advice. In episode 10, we spoke with Stefan Smulis on how to bootstrap your SaaS to a 7 million ARR. Let's hear what Stefan has to say. Yeah, it would keep it quite simple. I think right now at this moment, it's perfect time to leverage a personal brand, to build our trust authority, to leverage your first degree connection. So to do that, I should host the LinkedIn events. And with all the knowledge you gathered until the moment where you are right now, you exactly know all the pains from companies like myself who are leveraging affiliate uh, providers. I should think about uh, talking them through these pains in a uh, live event and follow up boost it heavily by leveraging your first degree connections, which you actually 90% of the time do not approach anymore after connecting with them and follow up on all these people after showing your expertise in a live session. Uh, I should think about uh, lead magnets where you show on a practical way how you solve pains or especially more important, how you'll be able to make more money for them. And I should think about giveaway strategies as your personal brand is growing, more people will opt in for that and the ones which worked for me and still working really really well i hit three viral posts only in the last four weeks only on linkedin and i'm, I'm not even talking about the twitter for example with a giveaway strategy 
I provide a lead map with pure value, with a practical information and bombs. People can value bombs. People can use and leverage to make more money. I should focus on that. If I see what sort of attraction it, it gets right now, then only doing that should help you to get in phase of the right audiences you wanted to serve. In episode 11, we spoke with Katja Riebova regarding customer-led growth and how to get started. Let's hear what Katja has to teach us. Because you're, it's still early for you, you're still small, you can use it to your advantage to instill that customer centricity early on. You can model it, you can start collecting some sort of easy customer research at any point without necessarily, again, relying on the whole framework to, to try and operationalize the insight that you gather for three customers. It might be a bit too early for that, but again, taking advantage of the fact that your team is small, that your communication is, is probably much easier. You can implement founder interviews, for example. At this point, the founder can easily talk to customers who sign up to find out you know, what made them sign up. They, you can add a one-question survey at the end of the sign-up process to, to ask them, hey, what brought you to our product today? Which gives you a great idea of how they found you and why they're here in the first place. And then because at an early stage, obviously the focus is acquisition. We just need more customers. You can use the research and the principles of customer growth to improve retention and to understand what makes those early customers stick with you and also what makes some of the customers leave and maybe not focus on that. So double, doubling down on what works, but knowing what works, you will need to, to ask your customers, even if they're still few and far in between. In episode 13, we spoke with Ellen Gleason on how to win in a crowded B2B SaaS market. Let's hear what Alan has to say. Yeah, so that's obviously an earlier stage company, right? So I get back to some of my earlier points that would have been around that it's, you got this inherent tension because at that stage, you're probably fairly resource constrained. You've got to leverage your network really heavily, but you've also got to realize that you've made some assumptions about the market that you need to validate them, right? Being creative and being resilient are going to be key traits. Um, similarly, you don't want to be burning cash on paid acquisition at that stage. You're trying to largely do organic acquisition at that phase because, you know, what you want to avoid is getting a scenario where your cash burn gets too big because we know developers are expensive. So in the early days, you want your main spend to be on salaries for the few product builders, right? And then only put on the kind of burners in terms of paid acquisition and marketing budget when you feel that the sufficient cash flow is coming in and enough evidence that suggests that there is a, a market there that your product meets the need of, because you go back to the point, you're making assumptions in the early days and you almost need to discount the few that are maybe friendlies or that are, that, so that they're great to have, right? But you don't want to get into this world where you're artificially validating your assumptions. So it's when you start winning new business from people with no contact or no relationship with you and they onboard successfully and they stick around and they get value from the product. I think then it's a case of going and raising finance if that's the route that you need to do or trying to get a little bit of a war chest together to go more aggressive in marketing. But you don't want to be trying to scale prematurely. You want to make sure that the signals for further investment or hiring are pretty strong and that they're not ones that you've misconstrued, which is easy, right? We all want to be successful, right? So we want to be a little bit more conservative about how we read those signals. In episode 14, we spoke with Casey Hill on how to create a demand generation strategy. Let's hear what Casey has to say. I think that when you're going from zero to 10K, there's two kind of things happening. Number one, you're starting to find one of your first channels, but I wouldn't force your, don't think about like you need to find your first channel by 10K. I don't think it's realistic. I think that zero to 10K is a lot about experimentation and just starting to look at some basic momentum stuff. The other reason why it's really hard, if someone says, what major things do you look at from zero to 10K? If your product costs $20 or your product costs 10K, 10K could be one customer, right? For an enterprise brand, or it could be a ton for, so there is some nuance there. But in general, I would say the following. Start testing these channels and start looking for momentum. So what stuff is showing progress? Going back to LVR, look at lead velocity rate. Zero to 10K, I want a major focus for you to be, look at the lead velocity so you get a sense of how you're improving. Don't obsess about the raw numbers at that stage. This first stage, 
page. It's like you're testing out channels. The other thing I would say is spend some time thinking about your network. Network is so key, right? On that early motion. And if you haven't spent the time to develop it, that's something I would recommend you start doing. Start going to the relevant in-person events, start meeting people, get active on LinkedIn, start producing content and start creating that thought leadership thing. Look, zero to 10 K during those early phases, you're not, you're very likely not going to become a thought leader. That's fine. That's not your focus. Your focus is to start to build relationships in the space, both from your own content, but also spending time engaging with a lot of the other key influencers and players. We won't go all the way down this rabbit hole, but if you're really trying to succeed in influencers, in partnerships, remember reciprocity relationships, what's the simplest possible thing that you can do to support those people is you can comment on their content. That is something that brings visibility to what they're doing. And it also puts name recognition of you on their content, right? Likes a dime a dozen. Everyone likes stuff. That's going to give you very little recognition. But if you comment, especially if you have an insightful comment that has some piece of interesting analysis, that can be really powerful. In episode 15, we spoke with Fabian Maume on how to launch your SaaS on Product Hunt. Let's hear what Fabian has to say. I would say the metrics which matter for product and launch is not Razor MRR, it's like how many users you have, because that's what would determine if your email blast is efficient or not. So I would say that the metrics to determine which type of launch you want to go for. And then specifically, if you have a big user base, you will set the goals that you want to get those badge for basically social proof that your goal is not only to have exposure, is to have one of those badges you want to finish in top five. So if you have like more than 500,000 users, you want to get those badge and you also will want to pick a more competitive day, like Wednesday or Thursday to have more exposure, like more web traffic. If you have more early stage, you want to be launching on a Friday because that's the less competitive day. You have higher chance to just get exposure like without existing audience. And last thing, if you are more early stage, if you need cash flow, consider a lifetime deal in parallel of product and launch. It can give you a nice runaway in terms of cash flow. Yeah, it is actually interesting that you say it because you now mentioned Friday as less competitive because like the most common advice you get is launch on Monday and then 12 or 9 Amsterdam time, 12 or 12.01 Pacific time. But you could actually also turn it around, launch on Friday. So the more you're more likely to actually end up number one of the day. Yeah, but I, once I didn't mention, if you finish in top 10, you are featuring the newsletter in the following day. So it is good to be targeting top there. Like being in top 10 on Friday is better than being 11th on Monday. In episode 16, we spoke with Rob Harlow on how to do sales prospecting for your B2B SaaS. Let's hear what Rob has to say. And at this point, obviously everything is totally different. And we work with a number of early stage companies and as they start to build towards a million AR, then really the founder or the CEO's main role is to make themselves redundant from every process. Sales is no different. So it, the most important part there is to have a repeatable sales process, something that can be documented, taught to your sales team, ideally to a head of sales who is then managing your sales team. To, yeah, so, so ultimately you're the recipient of the results as opposed to the person driving it. Equally, predictability in sales is essential as well. In episode 17, we spoke with Tom Dobbe on how to create predictable revenue for your B2B SaaS. Let's hear what Tom has to say. I got four recommendations. The first one is really define the problem as good as you can, because that's where a lot of things go wrong. Uh, people say, okay, our, pro our customers have problem with efficiency. That cannot be the problem. The effect of that is the problem that wakes them up at night. So if there's inefficiency, for example, around how you track time, people hate doing their time. It's inefficient, it's clunky and so on. That is going to provide issues, for example, around when the time is put in, so too late. Then when they put it in too late, it's wrong because they forgot what they worked on. That goes on the invoice. It's wrong. Customers are seeing that they don't pay. That is creating cash flow issues. That's wake them up, waking them up at night. So it's going in that direction. Define the problem as good as you can. In my book on page number 24, I've got a framework, which is the triangle. And Jonathan Stark, when I was on this podcast, he actually called it the broken triangle. The moment it's broken, you'll feel it. You want those angles to be exactly the same in value. 
it has three three legs, of course. The first one, if you look at the list of problems that you solve, so first created list of problems. The second thing you do is validate or rank these problems around three areas. How valuable is it on the scale to one to ten to solve it for a customer? How critical is it to solve it on a scale of one to ten? And what is your ability to exceed expectations on a scale of one to ten? And that becomes a formula. So when you put it into an Excel spreadsheet or into a Google sheet and you do this for 20 problems, suddenly when you start do the value, value, valuable multiplied by critical, multiplied by exceeding expectations, you get a number between zero and a thousand. Focus on everything that's above 500. And then you're going to be really having sharp definition of what you're going to focus on development wise. Then build with the desired outcome in mind and engineer back from that. And I gave that example. And then really focus on product market fit. In that phase, when you're going towards 10K MRR, there is no product market fit yet, but this is the way to get there. And it starts, like I said, with really clear definition of the problem. So create product market fit. And how do you know that when you take it away from them, when you say, okay, I cut the license, they will start screaming. That's how I always, my visual representation of, okay, now it fits. In episode 18, we talked live on stage with Top One Shooters at the SaaS Leader Summit in Berlin. We talked about how to have a product strategy that is going to win against big competitors. Let's hear what Tobin has to say. When it comes to product, I think articulate your product vision clearly and then run experiments with your engineers at a super high rate. Experiment a lot technically as well to find the best technical solutions for your problems. Don't are anxious to rewrite stuff in your platform. Statistics shows that it's the number one success metric for successful startups is the rate of experimentation and the rate of building and shipping. And I think this is the number one uh, advice for the early days. In episode 19, we talked with Julia Draghici on how to set up multi-channel marketing tracking. Let's hear what Julia has to say. If you go to 10K MRR, probably you are so early. I will say again, if you don't have an affiliate program in place, just make sure you get one in place and also use your customers as referrals, reward them if they bring your customers, help them with like materials and everything so they can promote you. It's a very good acquisition channel using your customers as ambassadors. So that, or I would say tracking your channels from the beginning, it's important to do that from the start. You will understand much better before losing money, where to invest money. In episode 20, we talked with John Wright on affiliate marketing. Let's hear what John has to say. I would say have an affiliate program. Just the fact that when we launched ours, we got instant sales. It was that fast that I wish we'd paid attention to it earlier. And I do think we actually need to pay even more attention to it now. And that's something that we're looking at advancing. I think it really helps to truly understand your ICP and create content for them. And when I say that, we went through our business where we bootstrapped almost everything, but we did take on investors and they asked these tough questions, like tell us about your ICP. How well do you really know them? So we created these detailed documents and we went down a rabbit hole of really mapping out that ICP doc. Uh, once you do that, it really becomes clear what your marketing message is and what it should be. I think that's a very valuable exercise where you can actually create content for them and know how to target them and know how to just make sure that you're speaking to them in the way that they want to be talked to. Be in the channels where your ICP is. That kind of sounds like common sense, but you really need to understand that my space is not the same as your space. And some people actually might be more on Facebook forums. Other people could be Telegram. In my case, it's a mixture of LinkedIn and a couple other big channels. Outreach, I think, is also critical and not a lot of people do it. So if outreach applies to your business where you can actually target, let's say hypothetical websites, then do outreach and it's, it's one of your touch points. And I think the other one that a lot of people never overlook, and I'm going to say this a couple more times is just ask for help. It's us looking for investors was almost like asking for help. They basically asked really tough questions to go, how are you going to get to this 10 K and when you ask for help, if I could rewind time and replay my story again, I probably would have asked more for help in this exact area. I would have gone to people like you to say, hey, 
this is our plan. What do you think about it? And I've done this recently with our SEO strategy with a lot of my SEO friends and the stuff they came back with was just, it wasn't just a big laundry list. It was amazing feedback and they all contributed different ideas. Some of them overlap. People just don't really do that enough. And I think we, in the SaaS space, we all want to help each other with the exception of maybe our competition, but ask for help. You just listened to all the advice of the 20 guests we had on our show in season one. This is the end of season one, but good news, we are continuing right away with season two and the next episode is going to come out in two weeks. We have one more bonus episode coming out next week, so make sure you're going to listen to that as well because as soon as you hit 10k MR, you definitely want to go and listen to that one. For now, have a great day. You've been listening to Growing a B2B SaaS. Yoran has been ahead of customer success before founding his own startup. He's experiencing the same journey you are. We hope you've gotten some actionable advice from the show. And we hope you had fun along the way. We know we did. Make sure to like, rate, and review the podcast in the meantime. To find out more and to hook up with us on our social media sites, go to www.getreadytus.com. See you next time on Growing a B2B SaaS.